What does it mean when something's out of order? Maybe it's a toy or an elevator or a ride at an amusement park. It means that something isn't working the way it intended to. It's broken. We're all familiar with the term out of order as it relates to objects or things. But did you know that in the book of Judges, in the Old Testament, God's people were out of order? And that led to some serious trouble. In the book of Exodus, God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Later, God gave His people the Promised Land, which today is known as Israel. There they followed God for a little while, but then the Bible tells us that they started worshiping idols from the nations around them. Baal was one of those idols. After Moses, Joshua and all the leaders his age died. The book of Judges tells us that a new generation arose who did not know the Lord or the work He had done for Israel. These would have been the children and the grandchildren of Joshua's generation, the people who conquered the Promised Land. Not knowing God or the work He had done for the Israelites is a dangerous thing. It should have been a warning sign that things were starting to go the wrong way. It's the same for us today. If we don't know God, then that leaves the door open for Satan to come in and tempt us to do wrong. And that's exactly what happened. The last verse of the book of Judges paints a very dark picture. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What do you think happened when each person got to decide for themselves what was right and what was wrong? Trouble. They were hurting each other, killing and going to war with each other. They were afraid of the people around them, and they were sadly becoming evil like the people around them. The Israelites were out of order. They even went to the prophet Samuel and demanded their own king, ignoring the fact that God was their king. That's how Saul became Israel's first king. They wanted to be like the world, instead of wanting to be faithful to God. Were some people still faithful? Yes. People like Samuel still followed God. But overall, the nation of Israel had turned away from him and did what was right in their own eyes. This needs to be a warning sign for us today. We also live in a world that's out of order. A lot of people have turned away from God and are doing whatever they think is right. That could mean lying or cheating in order to get ahead being disrespectful to parents or teachers, even hurting others, making choices based on their feelings instead of based on what God says is right. As God's people, we shouldn't make the same mistake. If we do, we will get out of control. It's easy for us to look at the world and want to be like them, wear the same clothes, talk the same way, do the same things, and forget who our true King is and the blessings that come from knowing Him. Don't let the world influence you and cause you to be out of order. Instead, let God be your king and use the Bible to learn about the right way to act. Did you know that God can use you to do great things even though you're young? It's true. God uses people of all ages to help accomplish His will, and He can use you. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, we read about God using Samuel even though he was only a young boy. He was able to be used because Samuel was ready to listen to God. Before God anointed His first king over His people, there were priests and prophets. They didn't act as kings, but were instead religious leaders and they shared God's message. 
In time, Jerusalem would become Israel's most important city. The temple would be there, and that's where worship would happen. But before Jerusalem, there was Shiloh, where people came to sacrifice and worship. This is believed to be the area where the tabernacle once stood. Inside the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant. This was also the place where the priest, Eli, offered sacrifices to God for the people. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, before Samuel was born, his mother Hannah really wanted to have a baby, but couldn't. She would go up to Shiloh and pray very hard to God that she would have a baby. She even promised that if God would give her a son, she would devote his life to serving God. Guess what? God heard her prayer, and in time, Samuel was born. Hannah kept her promise, and when Samuel was old enough, she gave him to Eli to serve the Lord. One night, while young Samuel was asleep, he heard her voice calling out to him. Thinking it was Eli, he went and answered, Here I am. But it wasn't Eli calling him. This happened three times. After the third time, Eli told Samuel the Lord was talking to him and to respond by saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and this time, Samuel responded to the Lord. Samuel was ready to hear what the Lord had to say, and he was ready to work for the Lord. God gave Samuel a message that was going to be hard to share. Eli and his sons had not honored God like priests should. They had been evil, and God was going to punish them. It wasn't going to be easy to tell Eli this message. It might even upset him. But Samuel did the right thing and told Eli everything that God had said. 1 Samuel 3 goes on to tell us that Samuel grew older, and the Lord continued to be with him. God made him a prophet in Israel. Samuel would grow up to lead the people and later anoint two kings in Israel, Saul and David. It all started with a young boy who was ready to listen to what God had to say. Just like Samuel, you need to be ready to hear God's word and to respond with action. Remember, you're never too young to tell someone the good news of Jesus or do the work that God has for you to do. When you walk around the lands of the Bible, there's a lot to see. You can visit hundreds of places mentioned in the Bible, and at the same time get a little peek of what life was like long ago. Every year, people called archaeologists are discovering new things that are connected to the Bible. How are these things discovered? And why are they so important to us as we study God's Word? Let's dig a little deeper as we learn about archaeology and how it relates to the Bible. Whether it's the pyramids in Egypt, the Acropolis in Greece, or the small fishing village of Capernaum, history is all around us. Archaeology is the study of history through the things that people made, used, and left behind. It's a type of science that helps us better understand cultures that we may not be familiar with today. In the Bible, we read about people that lived a long time ago and cities and places that have changed over time. It may be a real challenge to picture in our minds the places in the Bible when you live in a different part of the world thousands of years after those places existed. I want to take you to Shiloh. My friend Jeremy and I talked with an archaeologist who is digging at that site. Shiloh was an important city during the United Kingdom of Israel. It is where the tabernacle once stood, and it was the home of the Ark of the Covenant. Today, a team of people is working to uncover ancient objects from this site. 
like pottery and coins or jewelry. All right, there's a piece of pottery. In order to learn more about what life was like in the time of Samuel and the first kings of Israel, let's walk through the archeological process. First, you need tools like this to scrape away the layers of soil that have been uncovered. Once an artifact has been found, you clean it off with a brush and some water to remove the dirt and look for writing or other details that could help tell a story. Sometimes, piles of dirt are shaken up in a sifter like this to help remove the dirt and uncover other artifacts. Next, after you've uncovered and cleaned the artifacts, you can take them to a lab and look at them under a microscope where you can inspect them more closely. Wow, that's a beautiful coin. Artifacts that they want to keep are stored in a large warehouse in Israel where museums can borrow them and put them on display for other people to look at. Typically, after big discoveries are made, an archaeologist will write a paper or article letting the world know about the discovery and the importance it has for us today. In 1993, archaeologists digging in northern Israel found three pieces of stone that, when put together, describes a battle that one of the enemies of Israel fought in. It mentions that Haziel, the king of Syria, defeated Israel and the house of David, very similar to a story that we read about in the Bible. Let's talk about why this is important to our Bible study. Discoveries being made in the Bible lands help verify that what we read in the Bible is the truth. Archaeology also helps us visualize the Bible in a better way. Take these artifacts, for example. They look very different than some of the things that we use today. When we read stories in the Bible about an oil lamp or a coin, and we can see what those things actually look like, it brings a richer understanding to what we read. Archaeology can help us better understand history and the people of the Bible. And that helps us better understand how to follow the Bible today. Throughout the Bible, God's people faced many enemies. Whether it was the Egyptians while the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, or the Romans who were hurting Christians in the New Testament. During the time of the United Kingdom, God's people fought with many different groups. One of the nations that comes up over and over again is the Philistines. Let's visit one of the cities of the Philistines and talk about why they didn't get along very well with God's people. Israel is not a very large country. In fact, in some spots, it's only about 40 miles between the Jordan River to the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. With such a small area, these two different nations were constantly trying to push each other out of the land and expand their own kingdom. My friend Jeremy and I were able to take a small plane and see some of these places from the air. While up there, we talked about the land where many of the battles between the Philistines and the Israelites took place. Hello, Hodgetown Fellows, everybody can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. I think to understand a lot of the time in the United Kingdom, I think it's important to understand the geography as well. And of course, uh, there's really no better place to do that uh, than from the air. And so what we're going to do, Jeremy, is we're going to head over the uh, Shvela, which was an area between the coastal plain and the hill country was the border area between the Philistines who lived in the coastal plain and the Israelites which lived up in the hill country. There was not very many ways of getting from the Mediterranean Sea, for instance, up to Jerusalem. So those small valleys in the Shvela were extremely important. Whoever controlled the valley controlled the access. That's exactly right. And that just jumps out at you when you see it from this perspective. The Israelites mostly lived in the land in the middle and eastern portions of the country. 
near the Jordan River, and the Philistines lived in an area on the coast. In the Bible, we read about the five Philistine cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath, and Ekron. This area was known as Philistia. Here are some of the ruins of Ashdod, although these are from a much later time period. Look how close the city was to the sea. The Philistines were seafaring people, which means they often traveled around by boat. However, they wanted to take over other parts of Israel, land where God's people lived. The Philistines did not worship God like the Israelites did, or like we do today. They worshiped idols, or false gods. One of their gods, Dagon, may have looked like a half fish, half man. Remember, the Philistines were people of the sea. We read many times in the Bible about the battles between the Israelites and the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Philistines even captured the Ark of the Covenant after the Israelites took it into battle without God's permission. That didn't go well for the Philistines. God made their idol, Dagon, fall over and break and made a lot of Philistines sick. Eventually, the Philistines sent the Ark back to the Israelites on a cart pulled by two cows. Sometimes, the Philistines lost to the Israelites, especially while David was king. But other times, the Philistines beat back the Israelites. King Saul, Israel's first king, was even killed during a battle with the Philistines. So why is it important to study about these enemies of God's people? What can we learn? We can learn that God's people will always face enemies here on earth. While God doesn't call on us to go to battle or fight against these enemies as Israel was called to do, there will always be people who want to stand against or hurt the people who believe in God and follow the Bible. It's important that we don't become discouraged. Instead, we need to remember to trust in the God of the Bible, the true God, and if we follow Him, He will protect us against the enemies of today. If you're familiar with the story of David, you probably know him as a king or remember the well-known story of how he fought the giant Goliath. He stood up for God and for Israel. However, David didn't start out as a powerful king or a brave warrior. A long time ago, the town of Bethlehem was just a small place south of Jerusalem. Surrounded by hills, it was a common place for sheep to graze. This small town held great significance in the Bible. Jesus would be born here, and years before him, his ancestor David, a man God would anoint to be king over Israel. You wouldn't expect to find a king here, would you? In 1 Samuel 16, we learn that David was the youngest of eight brothers. God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem because he had chosen one of Jesse's sons to be the next king. One by one, David's brothers are brought before Samuel, but God rejected each of them. Samuel paid more attention to what they looked like on the outside, but God looks at the heart, who we are on the inside. Finally. David was brought in from the fields where he had been protecting the sheep and Samuel anointed him to be the next king of Israel. The Bible tells us about David's physical appearance, saying he was ruddy. That's not a word we use a lot today. It means he looked healthy. The Bible also said that he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. But more important than his appearance, we read that David was a man after God's own heart. So what do we learn about the story of David being anointed king? Being a shepherd wasn't a fancy job. In fact, it was hot and dirty, and the task of feeding, watching, and protecting the sheep was assigned to the youngest son in Jesse's family. However, this young shepherd boy was chosen by God to become the king, the shepherd of God's people. 
God doesn't care how old you are, what you look like, or how popular you are in school. God is looking inwardly at your heart. And just like David, God will use those who love and obey Him to accomplish great things. When the Philistine giant Goliath cursed God's people and challenged them to battle, David had no sword, no shield, no armor. He had never even been in a battle before. But one thing was clear to David, God was on his side and he needed to defend God's honor. The Elah Valley sits in the middle of Israel in a hilly part of the country. Today it's a quiet place and the land is used for farming. But in the time of the United Kingdom, this area was the front line of many battles between Israel and its frequent enemy, the Philistines. In 1 Samuel 17, we read about one of those battles and the story even gives us details about where the Philistines and the Israelites were camped. We read in verse 3 that the Philistines would line up on the mountain on one side and the Israelites would line up on the mountain on the other side with the Valley of Elah between them. You can see the layout of the valley just as the Bible describes it. And look right here, there's even a dried creek bed. Do you think this is where David picked up his five smooth stones? Goliath would come out each day and insult the Israelites, challenging anyone who would dare to fight him. Goliath was big, really big. The Bible says he stood about nine feet tall. No one wanted to fight him. But then David came along. He was surprised no one had answered the challenge and was upset that Goliath was allowed to continue making fun of God and the Israelites. David stepped up to the challenge and stepped out into the valley to face the giant. How would you feel stepping onto that field? Would you be scared? I know that I would be. What do you think made David so brave? He was brave because he knew God was stronger. He knew God could take down this giant. He was also brave because he didn't want the name of God dishonored. When David faced Goliath, he said something really powerful and really brave. David said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David ran out to meet the enemy, and with God's help, he killed Goliath, and Israel won a great battle. David was not okay with Goliath speaking bad about God or God's people. Like David, we need to be willing to defend God's name today. Some people will tell you that the Bible isn't true, that God isn't real, or that God isn't good. We need to be like David. We need to be brave and to stand up for God in His true word. With God's help, we can encourage God's people to be brave, and we can honor God even if others around us won't. Sometimes it can be hard to wait for things. Maybe you're trying to wait patiently for your birthday or for a vacation your parents have told you about. Now imagine David waiting to become the next king. God had promised him he would be king. He was even anointed by Samuel, but for now, Saul was still the king. Even worse, Saul was trying to kill David and David was on the run. After David killed Goliath, he became very popular with his fellow Israelites. He went on to be a great warrior. 
He was even best friends with Jonathan, Saul's son. All of this popularity made King Saul jealous of David and he tried to kill him. David ran away and hid in a very remote part of Israel, in a cave called the Cave of Adullam. The Bible tells us that while David was hiding there, his family and about 400 other people came and hid from King Saul with him in the cave. Imagine Israel's next king hiding in a cave. David was on the run for several years and eventually went to a place called En Gedi, which is near the Dead Sea. This part of the country is very dry. You can't survive very long out here without food, water, or shelter. David found all three of these things here in the deep canyons where water flows all year round. And there are caves here where David hid with all of his men that were loyal to him. One day, while King Saul was chasing David, he went into one of these caves. David was in the cave with Saul and could have snuck up and killed him, ending this dangerous time on the run. But he didn't. Instead, he cut a small piece of cloth off the corner of the king's robe. Later, he felt bad about even cutting off the cloth. In 1 Samuel 24, the Bible tells us that David actually went out of the cave after Saul and bowed in respect to him. Why do you think David spared Saul's life? Killing him would have meant that David would no longer have to be on the run from danger. Killing him would also have meant that David could take his rightful place as king of Israel. But David didn't kill the king because he respected the position God gave him. David recognized that it wasn't time for him to be king yet because Saul was someone anointed by God. We need to respect our leaders just like David did, whether it's our parents, teachers, elected leaders or church leaders. It's important to recognize that God has put those people in charge for a reason. Unless they're asking us to disobey God and do something we shouldn't, we need to listen and respect what they tell us to do. They won't be perfect leaders, but respecting God means respecting the people who have authority over us. Do you think it's important to obey? I hope the answer is yes. So here's another question. Do you think it's important to obey all the way? Is there a difference between obeying part of the way and obeying all the way? Yes, there is. One is called obedience and the other is called disobedience. Now think about that for a moment. In the Bible, we read about Israel's first king, Saul. He started out winning battles and following God, but something happened and he started to disobey. Eventually, his disobedience caused him to lose his throne and his life. Saul was anointed king over Israel around 1050 BC. That's over 1,000 years before Jesus was born. Before that time, there was no king in Israel, only priests and prophets like Samuel. God was supposed to be the only king the Israelites needed, but they wanted to be like the nations around them and asked to have a man lead them as a king. We read in the Bible that Saul was tall, standing taller than the rest of the people, he certainly looked like a king. At first, Saul seemed like a good king. He won battles for Israel and worshiped God the way he should have. Everything seemed to be going well for Israel under their king. However, it didn't take long for Saul to become prideful about his new power. Let's go to Gilgal. This land near the Jordan River is a likely location for the ancient city of Gilgal. In 1 Samuel 13, we read that Saul was waiting here for Samuel to come 
and make a sacrifice before Saul and his army went to battle. Samuel had told Saul to wait at Gilgal for seven days. At first, Saul waited and waited and waited. Eventually, Saul became impatient and went ahead with the sacrifice without Samuel. This was very wrong as only the priests were allowed to make sacrifices. The Bible tells us that as soon as Saul had finished offering the sacrifice, Samuel arrived. When Samuel confronted Saul about his sin, he blamed the people and made excuses for his disobedience. On another occasion, Samuel told Saul that God had commanded him to punish the wicked Amalekites. He was told to completely destroy every person and all their animals. When the battle was over, Saul had allowed the enemy king to live and kept some of the best animals to sacrifice to God. Saul disobeyed God because even though he did some of what God said, he didn't follow God's instruction completely. This disobedience led to God taking the kingdom away from Saul and giving it to David. That was Saul's punishment for disobeying. Now let's go visit Mount Gilboa, the mountain in northern Israel, about 15 miles south of the Sea of Galilee. It's here that we find Saul and his sons in one more battle, this time against the Philistines. Saul fought in this battle without first asking God for permission or advice. He refused to listen to God's warning to him. Mount Gilboa would be the place where Saul was eventually killed, ending his reign as king of Israel. It's sad that Saul's life and reign ended that way. God would likely have allowed him to keep being king if he had obeyed and continued serving him all the way. However, it's important to remember that there are consequences for disobeying, whether it's disobeying God, your parents, or another person in charge. Just like Saul, obeying part of the way is still disobeying. God wants us to obey him all the way and do it with a happy, willing heart. Have you ever had a friend give you a challenge? Maybe it's a contest to see if you can run faster or possibly beat their high score at a video game. Maybe it's a challenge that seems at first impossible. King David once issued a challenge to his men that seemed impossible, but one of his men stood up, accepted the challenge, and did something amazing. After Saul died, David finally became king. During the first few years of his reign, David lived in a place called Hebron, a city about 20 miles west of the Dead Sea. Today, the city of Hebron is one of the largest cities in that area. After seven and a half years, David set his sights on the city of Jerusalem. There were a couple of problems. First, the Jebusite people were already living in Jerusalem, and second, the city was well protected and was going to be very difficult for David and his men to capture. In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, David gave his men a challenge and the offer of a reward. David said, Whoever strikes the Jebusites first shall be chief and commander. The Jebusites laughed and made fun of David. They believed that even blind and lame soldiers could fight off David and his men. They were convinced that no one would ever be able to defeat them. But then, one of David's men named Joab stepped up to the challenge. With David's suggestion, Joab found a secret passage up through a tunnel below Jerusalem and captured Jerusalem from the inside out. And just like David promised, Joab was then made commander of David's army. I want to show you a tunnel that Joab could have used to sneak his men in and capture the city. After ruling for seven years in Hebron, David decided to move his capital to the city of Jerusalem. The problem was, was that the Jebusites were here, and so he needed a way to enter the city and capture it. He issued a challenge to his men, 
and he challenged them to go up the water shaft. The word in Hebrew is sinor. Sometimes it's translated as pipe because he knew that would be an entrance into the city and if they could get someone in there, they maybe have a chance of capturing the city. Joab volunteered for that and was able to successfully get in. For a long time, we didn't understand exactly what that meant in the Bible. But in 1867, a British explorer by the name of Charles Warren came to this land looking for different biblical archeological sites. And he found this shaft. And he actually climbed up this shaft and discovered this whole tunnel system under here. And he proposed that this was probably the way that the citizens of the Jebusite city came to retrieve their water. And so he proposed that this is the pipe, the water shaft, the sinur that is mentioned in scripture. How do we know that this could be that shaft? This may not have been the exact way that the people retrieved their water at the time, but this is the way Charles Warren came up. There are one or two other shafts in this area that Joab could have come up, but it would have been something very similar to this that would have given him access inside the city. So it still fits the story, whether it was this shaft or another shaft, there was something just like this that Joab would have come up to help capture the Jebusite city. That's right. Why would David ask Joab, or one of his men, to come up a water shaft in order to help capture a city? Well, the city of Jerusalem, the ancient Jebusite city, sat on a little peninsula of land that was surrounded by the Kidron, Hinnom, and Central Valleys. So it was very defensible. It was very hard to attack the city. I think that's one of the reasons why David wanted the city. There was going to have to be something secret to happen. And as you can see, it wouldn't be very easy to get here. Only one man could come up here. You couldn't pull a whole army. And so probably Joab came up a shaft like this, then was able to open the door and allow the army in. Sometimes when you choose to follow God, His Word may challenge you to do some hard things, like standing up for what's right even when you're the only one, or being willing to help someone even when you'd rather be doing something else. Sometimes God's challenges may even seem impossible. Like Joab, we should be willing to stand up and accept the challenge. If God is our king, we'll be asked to do hard things. It's easy to stay silent and hope that someone else will do it for us, but we should be quick to accept the challenge and be glad that we can be used in God's kingdom to do great things for Him. There's an expression that goes something like this. Someone was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It means that something bad happened to someone or they got themselves into trouble because they were somewhere that they shouldn't have been. David found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time and that led to some very bad things. In the heart of Jerusalem sat David's palace. In the time when David was king, this city was a lot smaller, but it was the center of worship and rule in Israel. You can still visit the ruins of what some believe to be the palace today. Archaeologists have made a lot of exciting discoveries in the area. An archaeologist is a person who studies human history by digging and looking for clues buried in the ground. They've uncovered a giant wall that may have been part of the wall around the city in David's day. From high up on the wall, you can see down over a lot of the valley below. Built into the wall, archaeologists have discovered houses, so people actually lived in the walls of the city. Wow, that's a big wall. We know cities had homes built into the walls, from stories like Rahab in Joshua chapter 2, verse 15, where it mentions that her home was built into the city walls of Jericho. One year, in the spring, when David should have been at the battle with his army, he decided to stay home in Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says that late in the afternoon, he decided to walk out onto his roof, which was more like a balcony for us today. It says he saw a woman named Bathsheba, taking a bath, and he thought that she was very beautiful. 
David asked about her and brought her to the palace and committed adultery with her. Bathsheba became pregnant and David tried to hide his sin by murdering her husband and marrying her. David had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Where should he have been? He should have been out at battle with his army, but instead he stayed home. That was the first step that led to David's sin with Bathsheba. We need to make sure that we're doing our best to be in the right place at the right time to keep from getting caught up in sin. Maybe you want to go to a friend's house, but they're a bad influence on you. Maybe you want to stay up late and play, but it's time for bed. Whatever the situation, in order to do the right thing, we need to make sure that we're always in the right place at the right time. When we read the stories of the kings of Israel, sometimes it's easy to get caught up with the interesting characters, the exciting battles, and incredible faith people show. We can forget about whose words we're actually reading. Today, we're gonna to visit a place where a hidden treasure was kept safe for thousands of years. And we're gonna learn a secret for finding God on every page of the Bible. On the northern shore of the Dead Sea is a place called Qumran. The area is very hot and dry. There's not much out there. However, hidden in the caves around Qumran were some of the most exciting biblical artifacts ever discovered. In 1946, a shepherd stumbled into one of the caves here and found a whole bunch of clay jars. And inside the jars were scrolls copies of almost every book of the Old Testament. Some of these scrolls were very old, kept safe in these jars for more than 2,000 years. Among the scrolls found were copies of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, much of David's most beautiful and heartfelt descriptions of God, and much of Solomon's God-given wisdom are included in these books. Think of it. The Bibles that we read today came from these and other scrolls saved for us after all this time. Why would God have kept these scrolls safe for so long? What does He want us to know? Here's the secret God wants us to know about Him. As you read the stories of King Saul, David, and Solomon, when you read the Psalms of David and the Proverbs of Solomon, you should always ask, what can we learn about God from this? The first kings of Israel were not perfect, not even close. But God chose to share their stories, the good and the bad, and save them for us. He did that so that we could learn that God is the perfect king, that He is faithful, wise, and protects His people. He wants us to be like King David, people after God's own heart. Have you ever found yourself distracted by something? Maybe you're trying to do homework, but you're also watching TV. Or maybe you're praying to God or reading your Bible, but your mind is really thinking about that new phone you want. We can all find ourselves distracted from time to time. Sometimes those distractions may be harmless, but other times they can get in the way of some very important things and lead to trouble. That's where we find Solomon. He had everything in the world but he allowed all those blessings to distract him from what was really important.
By the time Solomon became king, Jerusalem was a thriving city. The temple had not yet been built, but David had seen the city grow under his rule and built his palace there. After David died, God came to Solomon in a dream and asked him what he wanted. Solomon could have asked for anything, lots of money, popularity, power, you name it. Instead, Solomon asked for wisdom. He wanted to rule God's people and to be able to judge right from wrong. What a noble thing to ask for. That request pleased God. And in addition to the wisdom, God also blessed him with the things that he hadn't asked for, wealth and honor and long life. Solomon would be the greatest king on earth. Under Solomon's rule, Jerusalem grew even bigger. He expanded the borders of Israel to the biggest the nation had ever seen, and he built the temple, which was the most impressive structure in all of Israel. The temple was decorated with gold, silver, beautiful stonework, and wood imported from the forest north of Israel. Then after the temple was completed, the Ark of the Covenant was put in the temple, where it would be kept in the innermost part of the temple, called the Most Holy Place. Imagine being an Israelite and looking at the temple for the first time. Israel was at the peak of wealth and influence, and God was pleased and continued to bless Solomon. Solomon wrote a lot about wisdom. We read that today in the book of Proverbs in Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. He wrote about money and power and stuff, all being worthless because you can't take it with you when you die. He wrote about worrying and working, but then Solomon started to get distracted. He got distracted by all of his wealth, his power, and he married many wives who worshiped other gods. In a lot of ways, even though God shared his wisdom through Solomon, Solomon didn't listen to it. He lost his focus on God. Eventually, after Solomon's death, the kingdom of Israel was broken apart. Solomon's son would rule over Judah in the south, and another king would rule over Israel in the north. The nation would stay divided for hundreds of years. Tragically, God's people would be forced out of the promised land and into captivity. We can learn a really important lesson from Solomon. Don't let things in this world distract you from following God. One of the darkest times in Israel's history was when the people divided into two nations after the death of King Solomon. It showed that God's people couldn't get along with each other. It also showed that there were men who were not interested in following God anymore. One of those men was Jeroboam, who eventually became king over the northern kingdom of Israel. Once king, he made a very bad choice not to follow God. That choice would hurt his entire kingdom. After the death of King Solomon, who was regarded as the wisest person to ever live, God's chosen people, the Israelites, were divided up between Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and Jeroboam, one of Solomon's servants. Neither of these men were good kings. In fact, both of them made life harder for God's people. Rehoboam ruled the southern kingdom, called Judah, from Jerusalem. Jeroboam became king over the northern kingdom, which was called Israel. Because the city of Jerusalem was home to the temple, it was the place where all of the people would go to worship and sacrifice to God. This now meant people from the northern kingdom would have to go to the southern kingdom to make sacrifices. Jeroboam was afraid that if people went to worship in Jerusalem, they would want to go back to being one kingdom under Rehoboam and it would mean Jeroboam would no longer be king and likely would be killed. In 1 Kings 12 it says, So the king took counsel, that means he listened to someone's advice, and made two calves of gold. Jeroboam decided to build altars in two cities, Dan 
and Bethel. He told the people they had worshiped in Jerusalem long enough and that they didn't need to do that anymore. He was willing to cut corners, not obey all of God's instructions, so that the people could worship his gods without having to travel so far. Today, you can actually see the remains of an altar where one of the golden calves sat in the city of Dan. Look at the square platform made out of stone and the steps leading to it. Archaeologists, people who study human history by digging and looking for clues buried in the ground, have put a metal frame showing what the altar may have looked like. It was a big altar. As the people traveled to Dan, they hiked up the hill. Even as they took the steps up to the altar of the golden calf, their backs were turned away from Jerusalem and from the temple. Jeroboam didn't want them thinking about or even looking in God's direction. Jeroboam and the people of Israel literally turned their backs on God and worshiped in another city instead of Jerusalem where they had been commanded to worship. In many ways, people turn their backs on God. Think of all the different religions the world has today. A lot of people may think they're doing something good for God when they really aren't listening to what the Bible says. It didn't make God happy to see the Israelites worshiping a golden calf here at this altar in Dan. It doesn't make God happy today when we decide for ourselves how God wants to be worshiped instead of doing what He has told us to do. We have to be careful that we're not taking shortcuts in our obedience to God. We need to listen to Him. He tells us in the Bible how we should live, and Jesus shows us how we're to live through His example. Just like the Israelites, a lot of people have turned their back on God and are ignoring Him. We need to turn towards God and fix our eyes on Him so that He is glorified and so that the people around us will want to do the same.